Uh, before we start that, just want a big thank you uh, to Diane and, and the whole team that helped put this together. And uh, that we're going to have, uh, as, as Diane mentioned also, we've got some of the lightning panels after. There's still more swag. There's actually a raffle. So hope you will stay for all of that. Um, but do want to open it up first to the audience here. As we said, we've got, uh, if there's any of the sessions that you ruminated on a little bit and want to ask some follow-up questions, uh, we've got data science specialists, security specialists, uh, areas from all over the, the, the communities. So um, please, if there, there's questions, let, you know, let, let, let's start there. Don't be shy. So, so Clayton, maybe we're going to come to you because you, you, you have no shortage of, uh, of conversation typically. So just a you know, quick introduction. Uh, hopefully, you know, most of the people in the room saw your presentation, the KCP stuff earlier. Just you know, what you're working on these days and yeah. Sure. So um, uh, Clayton Coleman, um, I used to be the OpenShift architect and now there's a, there are a plethora of uh, leads and architects and I've kind of uh, stepped up a little bit to look at um, problems across the whole ecosystem and you know OpenShift is built on Linux, it's built on top of uh, OpenStack and virtualization and public clouds and private clouds. So I spend a lot of my time kind of in that space that Stu mentioned of trying to think about um, how we can do more to support the pieces coming together. And so KCP and some of the stuff I talked about earlier today is an attempt at least to look at patterns that we all um, are hitting and actually you know the the real call to participation is um, you know come find me today in this uh, meeting if you have questions about patterns that you'd like to see more broadly applied um, patterns that you noted that are important to you um, you know there's a whole host of things that come up every time I've had a conversation with anyone about this topic um, and it's kind of that part of um, open source which is it really is important for people to say what they're doing um, because frankly Everyone doing this stuff is much better at it and knows the trade-offs. Um, knowing those trade-offs actually helps us make better decisions about what we invest in, where we, where we devote effort. Um, what we, uh, I was having a talk with uh, Keith McClellan of CockroachDB earlier. In a lot of cases, the challenges that customers are having setting up CockroachDB in uh, hybrid environments boil down to very simple things that we can improve pretty low down the stack that if someone brings it up, um, it almost always is, well, this is an obvious thing that we can do to improve how customers and partners and community members work together to find, you know, the small wins. And actually those small wins can have big impacts. So, uh, you know, I, this, is, uh, this is the best time possible to ask those questions. Great. Clayton, maybe if you would mind passing your, your microphone up front there. And, and Peter, maybe if you don't mind standing just to say hi, just because I was looking at the camera angle, it, it, it'd help a little bit, but yeah. Sure. Hey everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Hunt. I uh, am a senior software engineer, and I uh, work primarily with Cryo and like the node level stuff. Sometimes Run C, sometimes Kubelet, sometimes Podman if I'm feeling fun. Um, so yeah. All right, we'll, we'll just go down the line here. Sure. Um, I'm gonna just remove my mask because it's hot and difficult to speak. But uh, hey, everyone, I'm Oindrila Chatterjee. I work as a data scientist. Uh, in the team AI Center of Excellence within the office of the CTO at Red Hat. And uh, we work on uh, various emerging trends in AI and ML within our team. And I spent the past year working on uh, building AI and AI ops tools for CI CD data um, while building these solutions and tools on OpenShift. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. I'll hand it over. Hello everyone, I'm Akanksha Duggal and I'm also a data scientist in the AI Ops team at the AI Center of Excellence. I am based in Boston and I've been working on the AI for CI project that is a tool that helps you monitor your CI CD processes and I'm also a data scientist who leverages all the open source and platforms that Red Hat provides us as data scientists. So that's pretty much about me. Hi, hello everyone. Um, my name is Hugo, and I'm part of the uh, product team that it's um, part of the uh, applications group. So we are doing all the workloads on top of OpenShift from Kafka to API management that you've seen in the, in the previous session. So if you have any questions on running your applications, 
your integration, your APIs on, on Kubernetes on OpenShift, just let us know. Hey everyone, Andrew Block. I'm a distinguished architect with Red Hat Consulting. I work with customers across the globe to implement container solutions, OpenShift, anything. So over the course of time, I've probably seen it, the good and the bad. So if you have any questions, come on over and I'm happy to have a chat with you. Hi, I'm Annette Cluett. I'm with the Platform Group and uh, recently I've been working on uh, multi-cluster disaster recovery. Uh, especially how it applies to using like Rook stuff to do uh, mirroring and um, in particular also advanced cluster management orchestrating all of that. Thanks. Hi folks, Kirsten Newcomer. I lead the security pillar uh, product management team that includes Red Hat advanced cluster security. So we focus on ensuring that uh, OpenShift is hardened by default, that we provide automated, uh, give you the ability to automate compliance with security and regulatory controls with the compliance operator, continuously investing, working closely with the um, CTO's office on things like Keylime for attestation, SigStore also with Andy Block on SigStore. Uh, kind of making it easier to add signing into the CICD process. Did somebody say slow down? Uh, oh, okay. It was the other room. So, <laughs> so um, tons of stuff. Plus uh, runtime security, uh, working upstream with Kube Security SIG also as they work to replace pod security policies. We're going to continue to support security context constraints in OpenShift but also uh, work to with things like OPA Gatekeeper, Kyverno, um, and as the community evolves, the pod security, which is the new name for what's going to replace pod security policies, drives me nuts. Um, <laughs> we'll be working on that too. Runtime behavioral analysis, deep observability, all sorts of stuff coming your way. Um, come find me if you have questions. Hi, I'm Karina Angel. I'm on the OpenShift product management team. I cover uh, cloud packs, um, which are IBM is one of our largest partners. So uh, it kind of covers a lot of areas and the lessons that we've learned um, in implementing and uh, running cloud packs on OpenShift have really helped uh, the rest of the product. So you'll find uh, areas just across OpenShift that are um, just better for what we have learned with cloud packs. And uh, I also cover um, some upstream work, uh, open cluster management. Talked about earlier today that's um, going into sandbox for CNCF. Uh, Kubevert, a lot of people are interested in Kubevert right now. That one we're getting into incubation. Um, Helm, and I also work with Andy Block. <laughs> so. I think almost everybody knows Andy. Um, I'm a Helm maintainer as well, and we have a talk tomorrow morning. So, um, yeah, so cover a lot of different aspects. Hi, I'm Daniel O. I'm technical marketing major, uh, most likely developer advocate at Red Hat. And I spend a lot of time to evangelize the uh, Kubernetes navy application, like a Quarkus and Spring Boot, and also like a data grid, something like that, on Kubernetes and OpenShift, of course. And also, I'm responsible for CNCF ambassador and specifically this Kube, uh, KubeCon. I'm uh, responsible for serverless track chair. So. I'm uh, specialized the serverless and the service mesh to integrate the cloud every application. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, so let me see. We actually got a question from the virtual Diane fed into us from Hopin. Um, it, it, I'm waiting for her to type it in. So I, I've got a piece. But just, just real quick, uh, as I told you at the beginning, my name is Stu Miniman. Uh, I joined Red Hat one year ago today. Uh, I'm on the OpenShift pr product marketing team. I do lots of executive meetings, meet with our customers. Uh, I was an analyst for a decade, so I, I do a lot uh, to talking to our press and analysts. Uh, if you had attended this show, I, I was one of the hosts of the Cube for uh, basically since they started that uh, a decade ago. So um, 
exciting times. Uh, everyone here, uh, one of the nice things, if you made it here in person, is we have a little more bandwidth to meet and talk and go a little bit deeper. As, as Clayton said, this is like the hallway track that we've all been missing, and you get to do it like all week. And that's mostly who showed up here. So we really appreciate you all coming. Um, also, if you know people that are looking for jobs, Red Hat is hiring. There's a, 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 a hiring social Thursday morning. Uh, if you hadn't heard about it, please let them know. Um, like I, I know the technical marketing team, we've actually got like five like more uh, associate level uh, positions open. Uh, and yeah, yeah, and right, product management and engineering. There are a lot of openings, so it's it's good times. Um, please look them up and just find anybody at Red Hat. We love to help connect people and tell them that. But um, I did uh, the the question that came in now is with many products interacting with each other, how to maintain the SLDC lifecycle across both product and operating system? So yes, that that's fun. And um, we might get you go to weigh in as well, I don't know. So it's a large team and there are a lot of, a lot of parts. So we do quarterly planning. Uh, we have to kind of do relative, reasonably relative alignment between RHEL releases, right? RHEL Core OS is built from RHEL binaries. Uh, so OpenShift 4.8 uses RHEL 8.4 binaries. 4.9 will also use 8.4 binaries. 4.9 is coming out any day. Um, and then ACM has uh, aligned their releases with uh, OpenShift releases. So just as Kube has gone to three times a year, so will OpenShift. And ACM releases typically about two weeks after that. ACS right now is, is moving from a three-week release cadence to a six-week release cadence. And we'll be figuring out kind of over uh, the next year whether, that, whether we're going to maintain that or get more closely aligned with OpenShift. We'll kind of see how that goes. Um, and then most of the key components line up. So like service, me service mesh releases pretty close to an OpenShift release. Uh, OpenShift Data Foundation is slightly different release cycle. Somebody else here might know better than I, um, but delayed a little bit. Annette would yeah, know. OpenShift Data Foundation, which used to be OpenShift Container Storage, um, pretty much tries to line up with OpenShift, but usually we're, you know, a little bit off, a little bit delayed compared to the OpenShift awesome. release. So we keep, we keep working at it. We have a lot of coordination across the teams. We have a large program management team also that kind of helps with that. If there are more specific questions or individual pieces that you care about, um, let us know. But we do have lifecycle pages that lay this out on redhat.com, Red Hat OpenShift lifecycle. Uh, and then also it will have a reference to layered solutions. All right. A any other questions? Hi. So um, this might be a slightly tough question, but you know you have enough people. So a few a few years ago, before the world change, I remember the big discussion was oh, Kubernetes is boring and. You know, this. And I always knew that was kind of BS because there's so much to do. And for me, I see three areas, and I want you guys to talk about specifically what we're, you know, Red Hat is trying to do. So one is like multi tenancy and scaling. And obviously, you talked about some of it, but I haven't seen anything done around multi tenancy. So that instead of having everybody solve multi tenancy themselves for large scale SaaS, it can be part of the system. Another one is security, and obviously there's a lot of discussion on security, but one that's sort of hot is this code signing chains, right, like six store and so on. And that's certainly, you know, hopefully something that, that's already in the line. And last thing is ease of use, because every single customer I talk to, and I talk to hundreds, everybody says how difficult it is once you don't have any enough experience, obviously, right? So those two areas, if you can speak to that. We got the whole week to cover that one, right? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll take the first one real quick. So multi-tenancy is one of those things that um, 
I mean, even before Kubernetes, before any, even before we had namespaces, right? A Red Hatter um, helped drive the design of namespaces in Kube, uh, quota, limit ranges. Uh, we spent a lot of time on security context constraints, pod security policy evolved. There are only certain problems that can be solved inside a Kube cluster. And so part of the talk um, from earlier and where we're trying to think of is, um, what are the pieces of multi-tenancy that are useful? And you asked a very good question earlier about federation. The thing that federation lacked was any real concept of how you break apart the individual problems uh, so that you can evolve those independently. And I'll give an example here. So if you have 70 clusters, you have 70 different versions of operators, software, API, lifecycle. You can automate those to bring them into alignment, but each one of those is a unique failure domain. And that's how Cube's designed. Uh, what I'd like to see, and I think what we're kind of gearing up is there's, there's small efforts, medium-sized efforts, and big efforts. I want to talk about the big effort. The big effort really is to help us do API evolution at the large scale. So uh, imagine that you have a um, integration that you want to roll out to, let's say, 10,000 applications. How do you roll that out safely? Um, you need to decide who's going to test it first. How do you test it close to production? How do you roll that out uh, roll that out in a controlled fashion. What happens when someone is using one field, one very specific combination of behavior, and you break it? What are the metrics that tell you, you just broke 10% of your fleet, 15% of your applications? What if that issue only emerges later? How do you work backwards from that event? So there's a lot of problems inside a cube cluster, um, CRDs, extension of cube. Uh, we're never we're never going to support tenancy within a cluster of APIs, different APIs for different namespaces, because it's a fundamental characteristic of Kube. And that's partially what kind of drove that higher layer question is, uh, we can take those concepts. We can take a chunk of APIs with namespaces and RBAC and all that magic with the existing Kube APIs, and we can break it up into little pieces. Uh, I think that's one of the ingredients that we need to have available of the ability to say, I might have 10,000 teams, 100,000 teams, and like your question about scale is, um, you know, increasingly organizations run the gamut. They might have one team or they might have 100,000 teams. And Cube solves a part of that problem. In open source, a lot of us actually recreate those same problems over and over again. How do we hand out resources to teams? How do you give people access to cloud account? How do you partially parcel out infrastructure, how do you do cost management, how do you give access to certain APIs to some people, like the ability to create clusters and take it away from others. Uh, we would, I would really like to, and this is a key part of our investigation in KCP, is try to break those little chunks up so you can say, I get an API space that feels cube-like, that I can do all the things in, I can add new APIs, but those are mine. Then I can go to the next level, scale them out. Um, that's like the big change but below that would be, okay, well then that would help us in ACM, that would help us in Argo, that would help us in CI. Um, how do you give people access to new types of APIs? Like maybe you get part of the API for pipelines, but not the other part. We don't have a lot of tools to um, control access above a cluster. And so there's an element of investment in that area. And uh, you know, as we go down further in the stack, there will be implications to it, but I, I really do think that you can't build multi-tenancy into Cube as it is without breaking too much of what we do. So we're gonna try and take Cube and lift it up to that higher level. I, I think that, yeah, that's a great summary. And also, we're also investing in separation of control plane and data plane, which is another significant area that enables serious multi-tenancy. Right, and give, give uh, our large customers the ability to have a control plane that can manage multiple cluster data planes. So existing multi-tenancy, as, as Clayton said, there are limitations to what we can do, but there's still a lot there. SE Linux, SCCs, RBAC, namespaces, a lot of things in place, and a lot of investment going on in Red Hat to, to really enhance that space. I'm gonna ask Andy to talk about the SIG store question. You read my mind. You read my mind. So as you know, SIG store is a project that Red Hat is being, you know, actively involved in from a product management side. You know, Kirsten will certainly attest to that we're doing a lot of work within Red Hat to bring a lot of those tools into our ecosystem. So in the future, you're going to start seeing more of those part of the product itself, everything from the fundamental Red Hat Enterprise Linux core OS layer all the way up through OpenShift Container Platform, as well as, you know, 
the container is just one aspect of your so entire software supply chain. Looking in aside from your uh, container image, you want to also think about how are you protecting the source code? How are you packaging all your dependencies? That is just something you need to think about and something that you know we'll be working with the open source community as a whole to help evolve the concept of an SBOM and other tools similar to that. So be on the lookout. Some good stuff is on the way. So ease of use is one of the hardest problems, I think, uh, which is uh, what are we trying to make easy? And um, one of the things we often notice is uh, there's so many different ways of making things easy. OpenShift actually, uh, you know, from the very beginning, was about trying to streamline that development process. That was PaaS, was really an attempt to make the first experience simple and to keep it at that high level. Unfortunately, uh, reality is a lot messier, and the PaaS that we ended up with is this wealth of different choices. You know, some people may want to trade Tecton or Argo for Jenkins or uh, a more opinionated uh, build flow. Uh, a focus for us will be trying to bring together an experience that makes the application development story that we're all using a little bit more effective and well integrated. Um, but I think there's some real, I think there's, this is a hard problem that is a combination of the, the need for capability within our ecosystem combined with every additional bit uh, makes things more complex. And it's where those things intersect that it really gets hard is, you know, the power of a Tecton pipeline. You know, Tecton pipelines are pretty darn powerful, but they can't do everything when you need to cross out of that. How much do you abstract pipelines for your organization? Um, and I think uh, we're always looking at this. Uh, our focus probably in the near um, to midterm is trying to build experiences around those common paths that I mentioned, looking for ways of, you know, what are the common patterns that work for 75, 80% of users and really drilling down on experiences that try to hide details that um, are there. And, you know, if, if everybody stopped asking for new exciting features that make all this stuff, I think this would get easier. Um, but then that would be boring, as you said, and uh, we wouldn't have much to do. And we wouldn't go to KubeCon because there'd be no point. I'm going to add to that. So with each release, I mean, we have a lot of product managers and a lot of engineering teams, right? Just covering the entire platform. With each release, as Kubernetes is maturing, as OpenShift continues to mature, that gives the teams opportunities to further um, make it simpler, right? Because hard is easy. <laughs> That's the quote of the week, I right? think. Thank you, thank you. And uh, easy is actually very difficult. So, uh, yeah, like I said, like each release, every team is looking at this. And you can see it with each time, like 4.9, when you start playing with it, you'll see like there's different aspects that are easier. Um, I talked earlier about how Argo, um, like, just the UI is just simplifying the different UIs and not having to go different places to do things. Um, yeah, it, and it's that across the entire platform. Um, so just wanted to add that. We did get another question online from uh, courtesy of Diane. Um, it ties in a little bit to some of this, but um, it, something we all look at is it, developers, you know, what do they need to be aware of and, and think about for future fixes? This question specifically asking about security risk and vulnerabilities, you know, what container images they're using in building uh, and vulnerability drift uh, at runtime. So I think a couple of our presentations today on GitOps covered a little bit of it, but yeah, sure. Andy. Kirsten, you know, I'll, I'll start and, Rock, paper, and Andy, I'm sure will weigh in. Uh, so one of the things we talk about internally a certain amount is that um, is the state of vulnerability scanners, uh, which is, is frankly a challenge, right? One, one of the things folks are dealing with is an overwhelming amount of vulnerability data that comes out of scanning an image, uh, et cetera. And so there are a couple of angles to take. One is for the developer, the earlier you can find the information, the easier it is to fix. So using things like IDE plugins with sneak data um, available to you with your, you know, from Red Hat with your OpenShift subscription really can help. Yes, you want to use image scanners on your on your images that are stored in your registry, ideally a certified image scanner so that you get Red Hat data if you're using a Red Hat base image as part of your custom build. Uh, 
you know, that'll give you data that links to fixes as well, but it's still overwhelming. So, so there's a supplement you can, you can look at. Like if you can scan, leverage something like Red Hat Advanced Cluster Security or some of our other security partners that give you runtime behavioral analysis and runtime context, I mean, you don't wanna wait until then, but leverage that data, leverage, use it on your test cluster. Right? Don't wait till production. Use those tools in your test cluster so you can see which vulnerability, which, which pods are actually exposed to the internet if it, if it were going to be exposed to the internet, right? And, and contextualize and get a little bit more information to help inform your focus and, and do some risk assessment. I work with a lot of development teams at different organizations, and one of the key challenges I see is they're just getting into containerization still. I mean, some of us in the room, they've been doing containers for many years. Some organizations still are at their infancy or pretty young in them. The challenge we see is that you involve the security team too late, which is where I, you cause your developers to bang their heads on the desk multiple times because they will spend hours and hours developing the best code ever. It works fine in development, et cetera. They don't actually turn on scanning until they hit towards production. And then they realize, oh, all that you know, time that I wasted building my container perfectly has a vulnerability because I did X, Y, and Z incorrectly. If you tell them ahead of time using tools like Kirsten mentioned, IDE plugins, scanning tools, make it easier for developers to become self-sufficient as well as self-aware so they can better with themselves. Because anything that they can do to get the process down faster, get releases out faster, will then make their product managers even happier. I was actually gonna to touch on a point there. So um, talking about moving things left in the pipeline, um, one of the things I think has been most successful about open source is when uh, we pick technologies and patterns that actually force ourselves to, uh, they both make a problem more obvious and they make it easy for us to get in our in our path. And so a lot of the things that move security left is um, you're taking a lot of frustration among a few people early and you're distributing it all the way out to the people who actually ultimately are the ones who are gonna have to make the calls on what makes, or, uh, makes that sense. And so I think a lot of the process when we talk about ease of use is um, can we get a commonality where you know people see this kind of information early in their process. IDs is a great place for it. Can you move the problem to a closer to the actual uh, person who's affected? Sometimes that means that the net annoyance is actually higher than one security person who's at the end of the day trying to make things, but it scales better. And ultimately that frees that security person to go deal with the actual problems like real vulnerabilities, improving the process. So again, a lot of what we can do in open source is help build in these parts of our process uh, to the tools and the technologies so that we don't ask the question, should I scan? It happens automatically. All right, well, I wanna thank everyone on, on the panel, the speakers today and everybody participating today. Th thank you so much. Thank you.